Um, part of it is about her tree sit, but it's more than that. Uh, there's some insights uh, that, quite frankly, as a person who's old enough to be her father, um, and then some, um, I found very interesting for a person of her age. Not an Independence Day, but an Interdependence Day, uh, to sort of celebrate not our independence, but our inter interdependence of life on this planet. Um, things like the statement, it's time we humans return to living off the Earth's interest instead of drawing on the principle. Um, talking about the cumulative impact that we have as individuals uh, on this planet. And I found this very interesting for someone who was branded by the press as being um, a lawbreaker and an eco-terrorist. Uh, and as such, our final award is our first eco-terrorist award. <laughs> to an absolutely outstanding environmental activist. Julia? I have a lavalier mic. Does it work? Yes. yes. Oh, good. OK. You see, I, uh, I sat still for over two years. And I like to move around now. <laughs> so lavaliers help with that, especially because I don't think I could yell loud enough for all of you to hear out there. But I'm going to talk, I'm going to try and project a little bit because I know for those of you way out there that I can just barely see your heads peeping up that it might be hard to hear. I am so honored to be here with all of you today and to be at this event because I believe in this event, because I believe in why we're all here. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be a part of it. I'm glad that it worked out. I, he was mentioning the book earlier. Just to give you a little heads up, no forest was destroyed in the making of that book. There's no chlorine bleaching in the processing whatsoever. And it's all plant-based inks. And 100% of the proceeds, my personal proceeds, are being donated to the causes that I work with now. So that's what... <laughs> And I mention it only to let you know that a lot of people say, oh, what you do? You climb up this, you could like write a book and become famous. Like, oh, yeah, that's why I lived in a tree for two years. <laughs> uh, but also to, to let you know that I really do believe in sustainability as a way of life and more than just as words that come out of my mouth. That I was raised uh, with um, a family that taught me some good lessons. And one of the good lessons I was taught was that our words without actions are hollow that we might as well as not even waste the oxygen that we use for them if we're not going to back them up with every moment of every day of our lives. And so I wanted to just share that just so that you would know, with that, since that was mentioned to begin with, that I really do believe what I'm saying and why I'm here. And I really do believe in why all of us are here today. I, I've been trying to think about what I'm going to say. I've never written a speech in my life. I don't do that. Um, and I know that I want to make it my story blend into why we're all here today. And I think it's important a little bit to, to talk about a little bit about who I am and where I came from. Because a lot of times when people hear that I lived in a tree for 738 days, they come up to me and say, oh, well, I'm so glad you did that because I could never have done that. And if you had asked me on December 10th, 1997, if I was going to do that, I would have laughed in your face and then went running screaming in the opposite direction. <laughs> But uh, luckily, life doesn't give us 738 days all at once. It gives it to us one day at a time. And uh, so for me, uh, the reason why I'm here and the reason why I do events now that have come down the ground is because more than anything, I want you to know that I'm a human being. Because of the media that's been surrounded around me, I, I, I have learned about a disease in our society that is as of yet not in the medical journals. But it's a disease called celebritis. The disease of celebrity that makes us think that just because someone's in the press makes them more different and more special than any one of us. And that's not the case. 
And so I really, I want to dispel those myths and those, and those rumors because in reality, we're all in this together, every one of us. We're in this planet, on this planet, in this life together. And we have to figure out how to do it together. So I like to dispel a little bit of the myths and then share a little bit of the things that I learned and then try and make it relevant to you. So what I ask is that as I share today, that in your mind you're not thinking, oh, this is the chick who lived in the tree telling her story. <laughs> and a lot of people actually do come to events that I do, which is great because they're not the already converted, who come to my event who are here to check out the chick in the tree and see what do I look like and what do I sound like and what am I talking about and see if I fit the stereotypes and the pigeonholes and the labels and all the things we stick on each other and stick each other in. But I ask that when I talk with you today that you let go of that it's not about the chick who lived in the tree, that for me it is about what are each and every one of us going to do every moment of every day to create the kind of world we want to live in. And that as I share my story with you, I'm sharing it because it's my personal experience and I feel like when we share our experiences we can learn from each other. And that for me, the story as I share it, if, it, if something resonates with you, take it inside and say, what does this mean for me? Not as, oh, this is Julia Butterfly Hill's story, but what does this mean for me? And even if you don't agree with me, that's okay. I do events like this, and there are and, uh, all kinds of events, and there's usually a few people who don't agree with me, and I actually kind of like that. Uh, especially because a lot of times I learn from those experiences. But I ask that if I say something that you don't agree with, that you take it inside as well and see if you don't agree with it just because you think I'm a granola munching, tree hugging, foo foo new age, radical extremist, wacko hippie. <laughs> 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 Depends on how deep a breath you take before you say it. Uh, and I, or, or any kind of stereotype that would come along, that, that you take it inside. And then if you have information on why I'm wrong, let me know, because I really do want to learn. And what I'm trying to share with the world is the truths and the beliefs and the passion and the absolute love that I have for this world. So that being said, I also ask that, that I don't, for me, I feel like if I've come to an event and someone says great speech or great lecture, I'm like, oh, 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 because I, I can't stand speeches or lectures. I like interactions. And so for me, an interaction with a group like this is that you, for you to be actively engaged in the feeling and the thoughts and the ideas, that it's not just a passive listening project, that it's really, what, what does it mean to us? Why are we here? And what are we going to do from this day forward as a result of what we learn and share together? So with all that, here goes. I was raised by a traveling preacher for a father. Most people, when I'm done with the presentation, say they see that in me. I, I don't exactly know if that's a compliment or not, but uh, I certainly didn't sit in the audience watching my dad taking notes. I was very, very shy my whole life because my father was the one in this position and now it's me. And uh, I, my whole life was about God and religion and, and my parents taught me that what was most important was saving souls. And my family was very, very poor and we had to eat the food that other people gave us and wear the clothes that other people gave us. I'm five foot ten. I've been five foot ten since I was twelve. And the relevancy of that point is that hand-me-downs do not fit five foot ten, twelve-year-olds, in case you're wondering. And the reason why I mention this is because I was made very, very a lot, I was made fun of when I was younger for being poor, for having to eat food that people gave us and wear clothes that were completely out of style. I had pants that were four and five inches, too short for me. And uh, people, the young people, the kids would scream, look out, here comes High Water Hill, you better get out of the way, you're going to drown. <laughs> and, uh, and that really got to me. And I decided, OK, I'm never going to be poor ever again. I'm going to work and make money, because that's what society tells me I'm supposed to do. I began to veer away from the religion that my family brought me up in, and I fell into the religion of money and the god of money. And I, I did uh, something that a lot of people don't think about. When I went into college, I did not major in environmental activism. I did not major in biology or zoology or geology or anything that has to do with the earth. I majored in business. I sure did. Uh, I figured we'd just go ahead and get all the skeletons out of the closet so that they can't be held against me later on. But it 
actually comes up in relevancy, as the quote that was mentioned from the book about drawing off the interest and not off the capital. I learned that from my business experience, and I've come in my life to see where economy and ecology really meet. But at this time, I didn't know that it was about making money, because I didn't want to be ashamed of what I wore or what I ate. Now, I came down from the tree, and shortly after coming down from the tree, I was seeing all these women running around with pants that were four or five inches too short. <laughs> And that's exactly what I did. I laughed and I was like, what is that? And they were like, so you've been in a tree for two years, you have a little bit of catching up to do, that's in style. <laughs> and I thought, why couldn't that be in style when I was 12 years old, man? <laughs> but you know, I learned a valuable lesson from that as well. I learned lessons from everything now. My mind, my heart, my spirit is so open after that experience. And that taught me how good the corporations have fine-tuned us as consumers. If I, at 12 years old, was wearing something that was out of style, that made me get made fun of, and now, coming down at 25, it was in style, what everybody was spending their money on. We have been conditioned and tuned by these people to be the perfect consumers, to keep them in business, no matter who or what is paying the price. And it was a profound lesson for me, because it just clicked. It was like, wow, I remember being made fun of that for that, and now it's in style. They have got us doing exactly what they want us to do. And so because I, I was all about money, I started my own business when I was 18 years old. I sold it nearly two years later. I became, after a little bit of different work, I became an independent consultant for restaurants and bars. I helped them make money. I got really good at that. People started coming to me and asking me to teach them how to make their money make money. I uh, didn't know about socially responsible investing at that time. I'm working off a little bit of karma now. <laughs> so I, my whole life was about this money mechanism because if you look in society, what are we taught? We're taught that our value as human beings is money. What do we look like? What are we wearing? What kind of car are we driving? Who cares if it's an SUV that's sucking up the future and spitting it out the tailpipe, causing global warming? That's cool. That's where our identity is. That we are, we are identified by how people perceive us and how much we have in our paycheck and in our retirement account. And I've looked at it now, and I got caught up in that world. And now with my business background, what I realize is that I got caught up in the same system that, unfortunately, too many people now around the world are getting caught up in, and that is that we're putting perceived value above real value. Real value is what every species on this planet needs, air, water, shelter, food, space, these kind of things that we need for all of us. That's real value. Perceived value is money and the things that money gets you. And so now, all of a sudden, air, water, space, food, shelter, clothing, strong communities, they're all going to service money instead of the other way around. And I didn't realize that at this time, I was totally caught up in living a life of perceived value, thinking it was real value, buying the bill of lies, the bill of goods that the corporations are selling us. And it took a car wreck in August of 1996 to change me. I was designated driver driving a friend's two-door hatchback car. And we were hit from behind by a drunk driver driving a Ford Bronco. And it took her little car and made it a lot littler and took the steering wheel of that car and shoved it into my skull. And it stripped away my motor skills and my short-term memory, amongst other things. And during the nearly a year that it took me to recover from that, I wasn't sure if I was going to recover. And so it really made me challenge myself about my own value systems, values that my parents had instilled in me and values that society had instilled in me, and to try and figure out where are my values in the midst of all this other thing. And the reason it made me think that is because I realized if I didn't recover from this wreck, I couldn't go back to making money the way I'd always made it. I couldn't finish a sentence. I forgot what I was talking about in the middle of a sentence. You can't help businesses run when you can't even remember a sentence. And so I realized that in society's eyes, if I didn't recover, I would be a big, fat zero. Nothing. And that really got me. And then this brilliant light bulb, solar powered, of course, <laughs> went out above my head. And I got this profound remembrance that's in all of our consciousness somewhere. Human beings have been around 
cents before our money. It took a steering wheel in my skull for me to figure that one out. Sometimes I learn lessons the hard way. But it was a profound lesson for me because it made me go, oh yeah, there must be intrinsic value for me. I've got to have purpose. Why am I here? Why am I alive? And that sent me on a search of purpose. I did not go in search of activism. I did not go in search of living in a tree for 738 days. I went in search of purpose. Why am I on this planet? And then I entered the ancient redwoods and my life was changed forever. I ran into that forest just running and running and running and running. And then the energy of this forest was just pulling me in. It was something like I had never felt before in my life. And then as I'm, what I'm surrounded with begins to hit me, I begin to slow down and I stop and I look and I look and I keep looking and I can't stretch far enough back to see the tops of these trees. It's like, whoo! Wow! And I'm looking at ferns, some of them that take four of me with my arms outstretched to go around a plant. And mushrooms of every shape and color and size. And usnea moss hanging down from the branches with a fog that's so much a part of these forests, these temperate rainforests, blowing through the moss and through the trees. And it looked like fairy tale world, but so much better. And I was just, it hit me so hard that my hair on my arms and my neck stood up and I dropped to my knees and I began to cry. And if you'd asked me that day, why was I crying? I couldn't have told you. I just was feeling something like I had never felt, something sacred, something powerful. And now when I look back, I, I realize what I was taught that day. Because I was raised in a world where human beings are constantly building buildings trying to get closer to God or Buddha, or Shiva, or Allah, or Jah, or goddess, or nothing at all, but to that higher power. I was raised in a world where we were constantly building buildings to get to that space. And I found that day in the redwoods, that in our redwoods, in what's left of our prairies, in our wetlands, in our mountains, in our oceans, what is left of our wild and free rivers, what is left of our wild places, that is the higher power going, here I am. I'm right here. You don't have to build something to find me. You just have to stop and take the time to appreciate where you are, because I am here. Yeah. And it was so beautiful and so profound for me. And the power was so overwhelming that I had my very first tree hugging experience. <laughs> <laughs> With trees that big, I swear, it was like a tractor beam. I couldn't even stop myself. <laughs> suggest you go out and have one. If you're worried about what people think, wait till nobody's watching and give it a try. Just be prepared for your life to change forever. These beings, they're connected into the power of the Father's sky and the power of Mother Earth and whether you believe in spirituality and sacredness of life or not at all, they're connected into the power of life. And when you go to that spot, it will change your life. If you're willing to be open enough to think that, ooh, maybe society has taught us to forget about things like hugging trees and appreciating this planet that we call home. So that was my first experience with the redwoods and it touched me so deeply and I left that forest changed. I didn't know how or what or why exactly, but I left with a new part of me broken open. And so when I saw the devastation of these forests, it broke me and hurt me as deeply as the beauty had touched me. And it makes me cry every single time I go back there. And there was a time in that tree experience where I was in so much pain that I tried to shut down because I didn't want to feel this anymore. I didn't want to hurt this bad. But in that experience, one of the lessons I learned so profoundly and so deeply that our, is that our power comes from our feelings. You see, corporations don't have feelings. That's why they can annihilate the people and the planet for a profit. It is our feelings, it is our hope for our world, it is our feelings that make us take a real look at the planet that we share and the lives that we live. It is our feelings that makes us feel the connection that the earth is something separate, not something separate from us, but that it is us, that our feelings is our power. But that day when I saw the destruction of the redwoods, I just bawled. 
because I didn't know anything that you all know. I didn't know anything about what's happening in the energy world. I didn't know about the industrial prison complex that's trying to push a monoculture of people just like they're trying to push a monoculture of the planet. I didn't know about what's happening to our food and organic food. I didn't know about clear cuts and herbicides. I didn't know about all these things that I know now. And so when I saw this clear cut, I just started bawling. And I said, this can't be real. This can't be happening in the United States. And uh, the people were like, that were with me were like, what planet are you from? <laughs> But I had never been around it. I had never been exposed to these things. So it was a really hard shock. And I, I saw that, and I thought, oh, I can't believe this is happening. And something in me said, Julia, you have to do something about that. And then, being the real human that I am, I came up with all the reasons why I couldn't or shouldn't be involved. <laughs> oh, Julia, you don't know enough about this. You don't have enough experience. Oh, there's plenty of people working on this issue, Julia. You just go traveling around the world like you wanted to do, and you just forget about this. It'll be fine. As soon as you leave, it'll go away. And yet in my prayers, and for me, my prayers are a way of life. They're not just a ritual or something I do on a certain day. For me, my prayer is every breath that enters my body and leaves my body. And when I start talking about prayer and spirituality and love, a lot of people go, OK, she's getting foo-foo. She's getting new age, she's getting religious, come on Marge, it's time to go. This has been fun, but I think we've had enough of this foo stuff. But I'm willing to put myself out there and stand by this no matter what, because I believe politics, religion, or science, or activism without a deep connection to the sacred is a dying system. It is a dying ecosystem. It is not a place where life will thrive. And so I started praying, going, because I was feeling torn and I wanted to do something. I didn't want to do something. I wanted to do something. I just didn't want to do something. And then I, I was given these pictures, and I was looking through these pictures, and I saw another thing that broke my heart. These beautiful young women locked down in a circle together with a police officer surrounding them, hovering over them. And I saw a picture that killed me, and I asked them what was going on, and they told me. The police officers had the women with their heads pulled back by their hairs, by their hair on their head. They had a cup in their hand that I later found out they had filled with pepper spray. They took Q-tips and soaked them in the pepper spray. They forced the young women's eyes open. Three of them, one of them was under 18, two of them were like 19, I believe. Forced their heads open, pried their eyes open, and took this, the pepper spray swab soaked Q-tip and put it directly onto their eyes. When they refused to unlock, they were locked down in, in then-Congressman Frank Riggs' office because that man had both of his hands and both of his feet in the pocketbook of the timber industry. And they were crying out saying, this is our future you're destroying and you're not going to do it without us taking a stand. And when they didn't unlock because of the pepper spray being swabbed in their eyes because they believe so deeply in what they do, then the police took the pepper spray, put it six inches in front of their face, and sprayed their eyes back and forth. I've since watched the video of that because I knew that I have to feel that suffering in order to be able to relay it, in order to help you understand what people are willing to go through for their beliefs. And the screams of these women begging these men, these grown men, to stop torturing them comes back to me every time I share this story. These are real people who have gone through torture to try and take a stand for what they believe in. What are we willing to take a stand for, for what we believe in? And I saw that picture. And then I saw pictures of these beautiful women all sitting down, arms in, in, wrapped around each other in prayer, and all their beautiful colors, and then, whoa, line of riot cops. A picture, women sitting in prayer, whoa, line of riot police. I was like, whoa, this stuff is intense out here. My God, they're sending riot police after women who are praying. <laughs> and uh, then I saw the picture that ultimately inspired me to take action. Because it was a picture that taught me very hard and taught some other people the hard way that what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. It was a picture of a Pacific Lumber Maxam Corporation clear cut that had turned into a mudslide, one of many on their lands and on, on timber industry land that practices clear cuts. At the bottom of the mudslide was a huge pile of mud and debris with the corner of a house sticking out. 
Next to that was another pile of mud and debris and a child's tricycle handlebar and wheel was sticking out of that pile of mud. And at the front of that picture was a daddy holding his little son's hand and both of their heads were dejected into the ground as they walked away from their home and their tricycle forever. And it hit me. I was just, I was so raw and so awake. I was like a child with new eyes. When I saw that, I just went, oh my God. Not only do they not care about the Redwoods, they don't care about these people's lives. And as I prayed, there was an answer that came so clearly to me that day as I was still struggling, but I don't know what to do. I don't have the information or the experience. I don't know what to do. And the answer that came to me in my prayers was, Julia, if you walk away from this injustice, your inactions are as much a part of that mudslide and those clear cuts and the destruction of the Redwoods as the actions of companies like Pacific Lumber, Max Sam Corporation. It was over and over like a mantra in my mind. Julia, if you walk away from an injustice, your inactions are a part of that injustice. So I was like, okay, I hear you. Shut up already. I'll do something, okay? <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no clue. For some reason, I felt inspired to go sell all my belongings, quit the job that I had been working at, say goodbye to my friends, and come out to California. I called this phenomenal a group called EPIC, the Environmental Protection Information Center, a small group of people who are struggling hard to keep the Redwoods and Douglas first standing in California. And uh, I said, you know, I'm back. I uh, don't have a car. I don't have a job. I don't have a house. I don't have any experience, but um, I have a lot of passion. And you can hear their eyes rolling on the other end of the phone. <laughs> We did not have you on our wish list. Nope, we didn't. Can we not please get someone with a job and a car and some experience? Just someone. Is that too much to ask for? And they said, well, base camp's the place for you. I later found that base camp is where they send all the people like me with no job, no life, et cetera, et cetera. And I show up at base camp, and I'm being told, base camp is closing. I'm not needed. And I said, well. Okay, that's cool, but I know the trees need me. Where can I get involved? And I tried to get involved, I tried to get involved. Long story short, finally, this beautiful brother named Shakespeare one day pointed up to a hill above the base camp, and he said, Julia, you see that tree up there at the top of the hill with a flat top? And I said, yes. He said, that's Luna. And I said, great, what's Luna? He said, that's a cheese it, man. And I said, great, what's a tree sit? And he was like, that's where people sit in trees to protect it, man. And uh, he's from Detroit. <laughs> and he's wonderful. He's the kind of guy that can get excited over a bowl of corn flakes for breakfast. He's just fantastic. I love his enthusiasm. So I was like, great, OK, cool. That was all the tree sitting lesson I was ever given. That's where people sit in trees to protect them. Lesson 101, basic of tree sitting. But when this guy, Arwen, was walking around and they said, we need somebody to sit in Luna. We need somebody to sit in Luna. I immediately volunteered because I had grown up with two brothers and no sisters traveling on the road. So I've lived in a couple of tree forts in my time. Nothing, nothing, nothing like this. Just in case you're wondering, nothing at all like what I was getting myself into. But it was something, at least I had a little bit of experience. And he looks me over and he goes, do you have any experience? And I said, well, you know, I used to climb trees with my brother when I was young. Does that count? And his clipboard goes up in front of my face. Does anyone else want to sit and learn up? Anyone with some experience? Come on, I know you're out there. Anyone with some experience want to sit and learn up? No one else would volunteer that day. So he comes back to me. Um, uh, would you mind sitting in Luna? <laughs> yes, yes, I started jumping up and down, yes! Finally, I can do something. That was the easy part. And then comes the hike up the mountain. About a quarter of the way up the mountain, I'm about to die. I turn to our oh-so-fearless leader, Geronimo, who looks like he's been carved out of the mountain. We're hiking up, and I whine in my oh-so-most pathetic voice, are we almost there yet? <laughs> he looks at me, I don't think so. <laughs> About halfway up the mountain, I'm thinking, OK, thank you, Creator, for this experience. I really appreciate it. I think I'm going to go back down now and figure out what I'm really supposed to do for the forest, because I don't think this is it. <laughs> but I look around me, and it's me, one girl, and four guys. And uh, there's one thing I learned growing up with two brothers and no sisters is that as a chick surrounded by guys, the one thing you do not do is wimp out. <laughs> you don't do it. There's just
it's not in, it's not what you do. So I'm burying my teeth about three fourths of the way up the mountain. I'm looking for a stick to impale myself on because death is starting to seem really good at this point. Right about that time, Geronimo points in this blinking light up on the mountain and he says, Julia, you see that light? And my knees are quivering, my eyes are blurry, I'm sinking down into the ground. I'm like, yeah, so what? And he said, that is the beacon on Luna. As long as that beacon is blinking, we know it and the people in it are safe. And it just whoo, became my beacon of hope that night, and I made it up the mountain. And I've seen how Luna has become a beacon of hope to the world, and how beautiful and powerful that symbol was on that very first night for me. Then I had to make it up into the tree on a rope the size of my thumb. And I looked at that and I said, I don't think so. They said, no, it's Shakespeare. Again. No, it's safe, man. It's cool. You got a harness to keep you safe. He whips out the harness, which is a belt that goes around your waist and two belts that go around your thighs. And the harness is held together with duct tape. <laughs> oh, great. I feel so secure now. tree quicker than they said anybody else had ever made it. It's amazing what fear will do for the adrenaline. <laughs> right up to the top of the tree, I ended up on a platform that was about six by six, it would take a little bit. I climbed up in the worst winter and recorded history of California so the winds took a little bit and took a little bit and took a little bit of it. My roof and walls were made from tarps thinner than the ones covering our head. Um, I had a sleeping bag that I rolled out in the night and slept in it, rolled up in the day, sat in it, had a hand-powered radio, hand-powered radio that was donated over time, wound it wound for 30 seconds, it played for 30 minutes, it kept me connected to a community radio station. This is the part where I tell you that if you're getting your information only from the mainstream media, you are a misinformed member of this society. <laughs> firsthand experience because I've done as much media as I knew how to get the word out because I hoped and cared that if people would find out they would care too and take action and I've seen how the mainstream media is this beast that chews up everything that's really valuable and important and what it spits out the other side is often not quite what you thought it should look like or what it really does look like but I had a powerful connection to community uh, media and it kept me in touch with what was happening in the community in the country and in the world so it was very powerful a lot of people thought that I must have been bored up there twiddling my thumbs. I got sent a lot of books. A lot of people also thought that I was living in this fairy tale forest with the birds chirping in the lotus position, oming, oh, <laughs> and meditating as the chipmunks danced around me. <laughs> that would have been a great experience, but that was not mine. I had two solar panels that were donated up in that tree that powered my radio phone that was just like a handheld you'd have in your house except it had been altered to have its base up to, two, up to three miles away. So the base of my phone was down in the town of Stafford where the seven families' homes were destroyed by the mudslide that was caused by the clear cutting of the hill. And I ended up spending six to eight hours a day on that phone. And I don't even like talking on the phone, but I've gotten used to it now. Six to eight hours on the phone. Talking to groups just like you, except for if I'd been in the tree right now, you'd hear my voice coming over the speaker, and you would see like a speakerphone up here with a microphone up to it. And that's how I connected with festivals and rallies and all kinds of things around the world. I addressed the United Nations, I lobbied the government, I spoke to Princeton and preschools, I spoke to churches, whoever would listen, I would talk to them saying, do you know this is happening? What are you doing about it? So that was my life up there. And uh, a lot of people say, well, what was the hardest part, Julia? Was it the worst, was it the El Nino winter storms that gusted up to 90 miles an hour and almost threw you from the tree? Was it the Pacific Lumber Company trying to get you out, hitting trees directly at your tree, cutting them down, hitting them directly at Luna, hitting Luna? Was it the twin propeller helicopter with 300 mile an hour updrafts that they hovered 75 feet above your head? Was it the 10-day security blockade where they cut off your supplies and tried to starve you down and blew air horns all day and all night for eight of those days trying to cause sleep deprivation, which they did? <laughs> they, people think that one of those things must have been the di most difficult time for me. And although all of those were difficult, the hardest part for me was living in an, a in an active logging plan. And this is where I start bringing it around to why we're here and why it matters that we're here and what we're going to do about it. 
because for me, sitting in an active logging plan was like watching my friends and my family being murdered and knowing I was doing everything I could to protect them and then watching them die anyway. And it was the sounds of the death that got me. I started thinking about that saying, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one here, there to hear it, does it make a sound? Let me tell you, it makes a sound. When these trees are cut in disrespect, when our ancient elders are smashed into the ground because we value them more as lumber than as an ancient elder holding wisdom and giving life, breathing oxygen and a stable climate, they let out a sound. And so for hours and hours, day after day, I sat in an active logging plan and I listened to the chainsaws. Ready! And then followed up by the metal wedge. And then the sound of the tree as it lets go and it screams and it cries out, won't anybody help me? Ah! Hour after hour, I listened to that. Until it was haunting me in my sleep, I couldn't sleep. It was driving me mad. I was in the fetal position up there, rocking back and forth, saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't take it. Make it stop. I want to come down. It hurt worse than I've ever hurt in my life. And I mention this because it's where I learned my most important lesson, and that's the power of love, the power of love in action. And people, when I start talking about love and sacred, they, get, they think foo-foo, they think new age. But you see, I didn't learn that through sitting in an ashram meditating. I learned it by going into my own pit of hell and making it out the other side alive. I learned it by facing my own fear, my own violence, my own demons. Because you can bet when those trees were falling, the first thought that came to me was not love. I saw the Pacific Lumber Max M Mill from my perch every day. I saw the logging trucks on the Highway 101 below taking these huge trees. They're three miles away from me, and I can see the trees on the back of the truck going to the mill. I saw this, and I was angry. I wanted to strike out and make them go away. I didn't want to hurt like that anymore. But my anger and my hatred was consuming me, and I knew I had to find another way. And that's when I found the power of love. Because I couldn't have lived in a tree for 738 days if I was there because I was angry at a corporation. I ended up being able to stay for 738 days because I fell madly in love with this earth and every species on it and refused to let go of that love. And there were so many times times I wanted to let go of that love. I found now that love takes a lot more courage than hatred and violence ever will. It's even in our words. Every once in a while our language actually makes sense. And the word courage, the root word for courage is core, which means heart. That's where our courage should take stands for things that we believe in no matter what. That's the only place it can come from. And I knew when they were doing all those things to me that I would not stop loving. When they had me under siege, this song came to me from somewhere in the recesses of my memory. And all I could remember was this one, this one little chorus. And the words were, love in any language, straight from the heart, pulls us all together and never apart. And once we learn to speak it, all the world will hear that love in any language is fluently spoken here. And I would sing that every time they started threatening me. They were pretty... A couple of them were pretty vicious. I was three miles away from anyone who cared whether I was alive or not. These guys weren't holding any punches. And uh, they quit after a while harassing me. I don't know if it was because I sing so bad or because the words got to them, but one of it worked. And uh, it really taught me over and over and over again the power of love. Another time my love didn't want to be there anymore was when I was one of the first people to get the word that a 24-year-old activist from... Uh, Austin, Texas, named David Nathan Gypsy Chain was killed when a logger decided a paycheck was worth more than his life and cut a tree down on top of him and killed him. I was one of the only people in radio contact with the activists out there that day, and so I was one of the first people to hear. And I threw the phone down, the walkie-talkie down the platform, 
and I climbed out onto a branch of Luna and I started screaming, no, 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 no. I didn't want it to be true. I didn't want it to be true that I lived in a world where people placed a paycheck higher than an ancient elder's life and higher than a young man's life. I didn't want to believe that, and I wanted to give up. And then in my prayers again, the answer that came to me was, Julia, they took Gypsy's life, but they didn't get his love. His love was returned back to the forest that he died defending. And he died defending it because he loved it with all of who he is. That is his power. They didn't get his love. They, I, told, I was told that day in my prayers, Julia, everything, the way you look, your car, your house, your clothes, your money, your life, everything that you think identifies you as who you are, any and all of it can and will be stripped, stripped away, but the only thing you have is your love. And I went, okay, I got it. And I dug down deep. And every time something new happened, I was like, you're not getting my love. You're not getting my love. The last time it was tested pretty severely was over this past Thanksgiving when I got a call that my best friend Luna had been attacked by someone with a chainsaw. And they had cut two-thirds of the way through. And I didn't want to love because I was hurting pretty badly. I lived for 738 days with one being without ever stopping. For 738 days, every moment of every day, I shared everything of my life with another living being. And when I got the news that Luna had been cut, I just got sick. I collapsed onto the floor. And as I walked up to the tree and saw the cut, I just started crying and all my tears released to the ground. And then I thought about how powerful Luna must have become for someone to attack a tree that had been protected and an area that had been protected. I thought about, this tree can't run and defend itself. This tree has been protected under a legal agreement. Whoever took a chainsaw to this tree, not only are they angry, but they're afraid. I see a lot of fear in actions that are that small. And I thought, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let them win. They're not gonna take my love. And so I said a prayer for whoever did it, and we got up and we keep on going. And that movement still continues. On December 18th, 1999, I was able to come down from Luna because we had reached an agreement with the Pacific Lumber Max Am Corporation where Luna and an area around Luna was protected forever under a deed of covenant similar to a conservation easement that returns sovereignty back to the land where it's always belonged. It basically, in its essence, says the land owns itself and no one can go in there and cut for timber, no one can go in there and develop, no one can go in there and do anything. It's a reserve, it's a preserve, it's a place to remind us that the land belongs to the land. And so when I was able to touch the ground again, I went through many, many, many experiences and feelings moment after moment and continued to. And that day was very hard for me, this last Thanksgiving. But continuously, I learned in that tree how to survive a storm. And I keep those lessons in the storms in life now on the ground. And I learned the power of love. And I've seen how, even after Luna was attacked, because Luna finally became personal to people, there's a lot of people now in the world who felt the pain of Luna being cut. In the same way, I feel the pain every time an ancient elder is cut, every time a wild place is destroyed, every time a person is oppressed or killed. And so it's really mobilized a lot of people who weren't mobilized before. And it's proven the power of actions, actions taken in love, that they will last no matter what. And now it comes back around to us, because we are here talking about sustainable energy and about sustainable living. And it's one thing to talk about it, and it's so powerful and important to talk about it, and it's important to learn and to try and create it. But sustainable has got to change and become a part of every moment of every day for us. One of my best teachers while I was in the tree was a logger from Finland. And the reason he was my best teacher is because in his broken English and my 30 words of Finnish that he taught me, I learned what sustainable forestry is all about. Because in Finland, they're so tiny. Their main form of economy is their forests. And if they clear cut their forest, they would literally have no economy. They're too small. They feel the impact of their actions immediately, unlike some of us in this country. And he taught me, and basically, Paraphrasing here, what he taught me was, Julia, sustainable forestry is not about managing the forests. They've been managing themselves just fine for a very long time. Thank you very much. <laughs> sustainable forestry is about learning how to manage ourselves within a forest ecosystem. 
And that's what sustainable living is. It's about learning how to manage ourselves within the planet, precious, priceless planet in life that we've been given. And management is not about controlling. It's about coming from a place of love and joy and service. It's about finding the way the natural world works and finding that if we will work within those systems, we will find a joy and a fulfillment that I never found in the money I ever made. So what this means is that we really have to begin to live what we love every moment of every day. As we point at what's wrong in the world, there are three fingers pointing back at us. That was a little thing from my mama <laughs> that I now apply in our lives. You see, it's, there's so much going wrong in the world now that it's easy to point out what's wrong. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing happening in some of our movements is that we've gotten so good at defining what we're against that what we are against is beginning to divine us. That as we point out what's wrong, we must embody what is right every moment of every day. That as we say no to this, we have to have the solution here. That we have to live it. And so... As we point at the man who is our so-called president, you want to test your power of love? There's a good tester. <laughs> For me, being able to say George Bush and think somewhere in there is a being of the creation is a good lesson for me in love. As we point at the fact that our election did not happen, that our election was stolen from us. As we point at the prison industrial complex that is throwing people of diversity in prison left and right, that is throwing them in there for things that no one should be in prison for. As we point at our food and how it's being genetically franken-fried and our future right along with it. As we point at all these petroleum companies, all these oil companies, as we point to all the things that are happening, as we point to Dow Chemical, that's creating the chemicals that give us toxins in our bodies, and then partnering with the pharmaceuticals who give us drugs to help us try and recover from the toxins they put in us. As we point at all these things that are wrong, there are three fingers pointing back at us. And for me, I look at those three fingers as power, responsibility, and love, daily life, community life, global life. We have the power to change the world because every single Thing that we do and that we say changes the world. Everything. There, you can't say something without it having impact. You can't do something without it having impact. But that's not all. Even our inactions change the world. When we see an injustice and we don't do something, that inaction just had an impact. We are all powerful beyond our wildest imaginations. What a perfect word for today when we're talking about sustainable energy. What about people power? Look around you at all the people at this event and see how much power you have as a community of people power. And don't let go of that and don't forget it. You are powerful, each and every one of you, individually and collectively, much more than what we have been taught to believe. We've been taught to give our power away to corporations, to teachers, to politicians, Everywhere we turn, we're taught to give our power away. Take it back. Reclaim it as your own and stand up in it. But then the second finger is responsibility. And that's the hard part. A lot of people don't want to live in their power because it comes with responsibility attached to it. And if we have the power to change the world, which we do, then we have the responsibility to make our choices compassionately, carefully, respectfully, consciously, actively, passionately. I look to the children in Los Angeles now, who every day a new child has to get an inhaler to be able to breathe the air. And that's just the children who can afford it. That's not a majority of the children in Los Angeles. Having to get an, an inhaler to breathe the air. And then as I'm going down the highway and looking at all the single persons in SUVs, driving in a traffic jam, sucking those children's air right out of their lungs and polluting it back to them so they have to breathe out of a con container in their mouth. That's our responsibility of our power. Because those people aren't accepting their responsibility, the children are having to pay the price. 
I look to the women in the Mississippi Delta, where a lot of corporations are given incentives, including weakening of environmental and social standards, to be in there to bring in economy. I look to those women who have massive amounts of pollution going into their air and water, so much so that their breast milk is so toxic it wouldn't be allowed on a grocery shelf. Their breast milk is so toxic it would not be allowed on a grocery shelf. And they feed it to their babies because that's what the Creator gave them to feed to their babies. Those women are paying the price, the responsibility of those who have not accepted the responsibility of their choices. Everywhere we turn, we have to recognize that every moment is a choice and every single choice has impact, every single one. And then the third finger is love. Why love? Why not? Why not? What else would we want to do with our lives and live a life of loving, joyous service to the world? What else? I lived my life for a paycheck and I can tell you I never found as much zest and joy and laughter and fulfillment as I have found in living a life of love and joy in service, in action. The third finger is love because then our power becomes something we use for the good. Our responsibility is no longer a, so a drudgery or it's, oh God, I got to do this, now I got to do that, now I got to do this. With love, responsibility becomes a joy in our ability to respond, our ability to take action and do something about what we care about. That is our love. We live our love because that's the kind of world we really want to live in. And then we apply it in our daily life. And this is the part where it starts getting a little squirmy for people. But please know that there is not an ounce of judgment coming from what I'm about to say, only an absolute love for you and this planet and every species on it and the future who's going to inherit whatever we leave behind. Because in our daily lives, the average American now is consuming 14 generations worth of the Earth's resources in a single generation. And most of that falls under waste, disposable, or trash. I come to events like this, and I see paper napkins, paper plates, paper cups, plastic, styrofoam. And I think about where that came from and what it's doing to the earth and probably an indigenous person somewhere and a child in the future. I look at paper towels in the restrooms or on the kitchen countertops. I look at the fact that we now live in a disposable society. Every native language of which we all have somewhere, there are no words for waste, disposable, or trash. Because we recognize that everything in the world comes from earth resources and human resources. We would never, in our original consciousness, call the earth or each other waste, disposable, or trash. We would respect the earth and each other much too much to do that. That's just in our daily lives, our food choices. And this one ties in huge with energy, just like deciding we're no longer going to use disposables. Bring your own mug, bring your own container, bring your own utensils, bring your own bag, bring your own cloth napkin. And if you don't think that's making an impact, remember 14 generations worth in a single generation. That's huge. Our eating habits are also huge. If you are not a vegetarian, I encourage you to strongly consider to become one, and preferably vegan. said and preferably vegan. You see, sister, not everybody's where we are, so you have to give them steps to get there. Because for some people who are eating meat three times a day, you tell them vegan, they're like, whatever. You say, hey, we got some steps for you to take, and they're fun, and they're joyous, and they will make you feel better, and they'll make the earth feel better, and they'll make the animals feel better, and they'll make the children feel better. One hamburger patty requires enough energy for one hamburger patty to drive a car 20 miles. One hamburger patty. Can I say something? Um, I wrote a speech about this, and I know you don't like speeches, but also it takes 165 pounds of um, rainforest matter to burn for one every quarter pound of hamburger. Yes, she was getting to a point I was about to make. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Just give me some time, all right? Because we're running out of it. Um, the, what she says, it takes um, a huge amount of rainforest for one quarter pound. Basically, that only happens in fast food restaurants. If you go and get a burger from a fast food restaurant, uh, it's three square feet by three square feet of a rainforest. It's altered a little bit depending on who's 
records you keep disappears. Because there are, in other countries, if I had taken my action in like South America, they would have cut the tree down out from underneath me and killed me long before I was famous enough to become a martyr. And so these people, even these people in this place are begging for our help, including in our food choices. Because what we are eating literally can hold the life of another human being in balance. Not to mention the trees and all the animals that live in that rainforest. It takes thousands of gallons of water for one plate of meat. It takes, to produce one patty of meat on your plate, 12 people could have been fed from the amount of grain for that one patty of meat. 12 people. There's billions of people starving on this planet. And we have meat sometimes. And I think, wow, if I could feed 12 people, wouldn't I want to do it? Wouldn't it be worth it for me to not have meat? And these are, these are the impacts just of our food choices, and the impacts go on and on, from soil erosion to um, or the global warming that's caused as a result of the energy that goes in, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on. Our food choices have impact. If that's not good enough for you, go check out a PETA video, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and how animals are treated for our food. And I have to say that, unfortunately, even in some, not all, but in some organic farms, animals are still not being treated very well. Ultimately, they suffer to become your dinner. If you question the suffering of an animal, watch a PETA video, it'll turn your stomach, break your heart, and hopefully change your life for the better forever, and you'll become a vegan before you know it. <laughs> so those are just in our daily life. Then we have to take it into our community. What's happening in our community? Here today is community. Don't forget that. As you are walking around, think about the power that is all around you. If you guys had a problem in this area, you could solve it right here today with as many people as are here, just like that. You have tremendous power in this community. The problems of what's happening in the energy world, the solutions are here. That's our community. That's the global community. We have solutions right here. I'm glad you're here educating yourself, informing yourself. If you want to know more about the Redwood issues and other issues, I have a table right over here with my foundation, Circle of Life Foundation, that I started that works on a lot of these issues. We have lots of literature and information and ways to get even more information. Contact that. If the, whatever the problem is, air pollution, water pollution, human rights violations, whatever is happening in the community, inform yourself and get involved. Third finger is global impact. The largest impact we have globally is with our money. Every penny is a vote on the planet and on the people. What that means? <laughs> what that in ultimately means is buy local, buy local, buy local, buy local, buy local. <laughs> Which is that supporting your local community. Support community supported agriculture. If you don't have it, start it. Support your local bookstores. If you don't have it, start it. Don't shop at Barnes and Nobles. Don't shop at uh, whatever, uh, Amazon.com. Don't shop at those places. If you already have, it's OK. Remember, there's no judgment here, only love. Just don't do it anymore. <laughs> Decide not to buy corporate clothing. Don't do it. Support thrift stores. Support local stores. Support your local people. If you have to buy a new, buy organic cotton, hemp, or recycled fibers. Make sustainability a part of what you wear, not just a part of what you show up to an event for. Really live it every moment of every day. But then it also takes, our global world is going to take action. And this is where I start talking about direct action. We have to recognize our impacts in our daily lives, in our community life. We have to extend our actions outside of our realms of privilege. You see, there's a lot of people out there, and I was one of them growing up. I didn't have organic food as a choice growing up. We were poor. We got government food. I got processed cheese food. It wasn't even real enough to be called cheese. It was cheese food. So for people like that, for people like I was growing up, we have to extend our activism and our consciousness beyond our boundaries of privilege to include these people, to make sure that they're a part of our vision for a better world. We have to make it a universal belief that we're all a part of. And as I've learned from being very humbled working with native peoples around the world and people of color, the one thing we do not do is go in there and tell them how we're going to help them. We go in there and say, how may I be of service? And we truly mean it. How may we be of service? That's how we're going to create the world in which we want to live. It is going to take action 
every moment of every day, it's also going to take direct action. There are people still in the trees in California because they're still hitting the ground. Luna was ultimately saved and looks like she's going to live for a really long time, which is really beautiful. And the area around it, the area around it is protected forever, even if and even when Luna falls, because she's going to fall because trees do that. She's going to do exactly what she's supposed to do and feed her natural nutrients back into her family so that they can continue to grow. But there are other places that are falling and people who are falling with them. There are activists out in trees, on the front lines. There's community members who've never done direct action in their life who are getting out there and doing it now because the clear cuts are happening in their backyards and they're getting flooded out of their homes. Direct action is going to hit us sooner or later. The more of us who get active, the better hope there is for our change. Every greatest change in history has happened when people are willing to put their bodies where their beliefs are. Yeah. Now that's not for everyone, and I don't want you to feel like, okay, every one of you have to go do this, because we need our teachers in our schools educating our young people that their value is not in the name brand on their clothing, that it's in the service they do to the earth and to each other. We need the people in the realms of politics, which is a scary place, who are willing to go in there and chip, a, chip away from the inside out while we're hammering away from the outside in. We need everything, but we need direct action. And sooner or later, it oftentimes hit people who never thought they'd be a part of it. There's people in California who will tell you that. But when we are willing to die for what we believe in, we find what it truly means to live. I have never lived in my life like I did the night in the storm when I almost died in Luna and I let go of my attachment to life and I said, I'm here to be of service for however long it lasts. And I yelled and I screamed out into the wind and I laughed and I've been laughing ever since. I found a joy and a zest for life like I've never had. That's what it takes. Power, responsibility, love, daily life, community life, global life. When we're pointing what's wrong in the world, the three fingers pointing back to us lie in the palm of our own hands. Our ability to change the world is in your hands. The future is in your hands. Today is in your hands. The world is in your hands. It's in your hearts, it's in your spirits, it's in your bodies, it's in your minds, it's in your actions, every moment, every breath of every day. We have to create a world where affairs like this aren't an alternative. Why is it that everything that's healthy for our bodies, our community, and the world is not an alternative? <laughs> an alternative to what? We have to make sure that we take the knowledge, the tools, the resources, the connections of events like this, and we take it out there and we don't stop. We make it happen everywhere we go. We stand up for it and we don't back down. No matter if we get made fun of, no matter if we get threatened, we stand together in solidarity. We say this is the world we want to live in and this is the world that we are going to live as we create the world, as we co-create the world we want to live in. That is our power. That is who we are. For our final wrap up, I would like you all to realize your power. If you don't want to do this, it's okay because I honor your diversity because I think diversity is crucial. But if you do want to do this, everybody who's been sitting can stand up and everybody who's been standing can stay standing. <laughs> and then you all should join hands. It's okay if you're like a guy next to a guy or whatever, that's all right. It's all about love here. There's no judgment whatsoever. Repeat after me if you feel so inclined because this is where I get to remind you who you are. We are power. We are power. We are beauty. We are beauty. We are justice. We are justice. We are truth. We are truth. We are love. We are love. The earth matters. The earth matters. We matter. We matter. The children matter. The children matter. The earth matters. The earth matters. And we are going to be the want to difference. And we are going to be the ones to make the difference. Yes, you are. I'm glad you know too. Thank you very much.